presentation, we want to introduce a tool, the so-called ProSocial Matrix. It is a tool that basically helps us to practice almost all of the six processes of psychological flexibility. And so it can be quite a useful tool because it is rather easy to do and efficient, and yet you're uh, training all of the different processes. So the matrix is sometimes also called a noticing tool, and it helps us to become aware of and sort and, and interpret different dimensions of our everyday experience. On the one hand, we just have this kind of dimension where we can distinguish between behaviors that are moving us towards what's important in life, things that we want to have more of in life, and on the other hand, behaviors that have the function to move us away from things that are painful or dangerous, things that we want to have less of in life. Another way to think about these two different aspects is to distinguish between behaviors that are about thriving, having a meaningful life that is about thriving and flourishing, and on the other hand, behaviors and experiences that are mostly about merely surviving. And we can, from our everyday experience, tell that these are two quite different qualities of experience. And these two different um, yeah, qualities of experience, they're really related also to how behavior actually evolved in many organisms. It has the function to, on the one hand, make us explore the world, experience the world, learn things. So play behavior is one of those kinds of, of behaviors that have evolved to have that function. And on the other hand, behavior also evolved in organisms because it allows us to move away from dangerous things and, and to protect us from dangerous situations. And so we humans can also think that of that we are also having these basic qualities and functions of our behaviors that we can distinguish. Then we have another kind of dimension where we can distinguish between kind of outer behaviors, things that we do with our body, and things that then others could also potentially see or hear us doing. And on the other hand, especially we humans also have a very rich inner behavior and experience. Our thoughts, feelings, sensations in our body, memories, these are then things that others can't see us, uh, can't see or hear but only we are aware of them and can notice them. So with these two basic dimensions, we have a matrix. And of course, the nice thing is that we humans have the ability to notice all of these things. We can notice how does our kind of behavior and motivation feel? Where is it happening? What's happening with our body? What's happening inside of us? So in this way, it can be a kind of noticing tool where we can be aware of different qualities of experience. And now we have this matrix and four different quadrants are opening up that we can explore. It doesn't matter, really matter where you start, but often we can start up here in this corner. And so here the question is, if we're looking inside of us, exploring our inner thoughts and feelings, um, we kind of ask questions like, what is important to me in, in this context, in this moment? For example, if we want to explore our motivations, uh, why, for example, do we want to become a teacher, if that is relevant to you or any other uh, profession? Why is that really important? Or what kind of teacher do I really want to be? So it's always good to ask it in the relation to a certain context. It can be just the moment that you're currently in right now, or also a more wider perspective uh, and, and important domain in life. So in this quadrant, the question is really about our innermost values and purposes in life, things that make our life meaningful, that allow us to thrive in our life. And so here to answer these questions, you might um, answer things like, uh, what's really important to me is to help others, to inspire others. 
And also for me, I want to learn and challenge myself in my profession. And maybe also things like the kind of teacher I want to be is to be authentic towards my colleagues and students or to show sympathy. So think about this for a moment for yourself. Try to draw this matrix maybe just on a sheet of paper and jot down some ideas that you have how you would answer these questions in this kind of area of the matrix. It doesn't have to be much, but just to practice thinking about it for a moment. Now the thing is, in life, every time, any time we're moving towards things that are important, um, sooner or later, later, some challenges might appear, some problems, things become difficult, and this is something that is just quite normal in life. There will just be challenges, and it's just kind of part of moving towards something, something important. And so our mind has actually evolved to warn us of these potential dangers and challenges. And so sooner or later, things will appear inside of us that are meant to warn us and make us yeah, protect ourselves, go away from things that might be uncomfortable or dangerous. So in this part of the matrix, we're looking for, we're trying to become aware of things that show up in us and that try to kind of hook us, um, hijack our attention and therefore take us maybe away from this direction here, trying to tell us that maybe going in this direction is not worth it or could become dangerous uh, and so on. So think about what kind of stories or things or feelings show up inside of you that uh, trying to warn you and trying to point you to point out to you some some negative things that are related to you moving towards what's actually important. So here are things might appear like thoughts like I will fail, it's not going to work, I will embarrass myself, or things like it's too much work, I don't have time or things like nobody will be interested, students don't care about this, so it's not worth it. And also certain feelings such as uncertainty, fear or stress might appear uh, sooner or later as you're trying to move into this direction. So the thing is that again, these are just things that sooner or later appear in all of us at some point. And these thoughts and feelings tend to, we experience them kind of as negative, not very comfortable, and we try to get rid of them. So another thing to notice and be aware of is the kind of behaviors that we tend to show to do with our body in reaction to these thoughts and feelings. So here we ask, what do I tend to do when I am in the grip of the thoughts and feelings in this quadrant. All of us, as I said, automatically tend to sometimes do certain things to, uh, to get rid of or avoid these thoughts and feelings. So maybe things we tend to do is just quit, remove us from the situation so that we don't have stress or this sense of uncertainty or fear of failure or somebody who is perfectionist might be spending too much time preparing things, which again serves to avoid or get rid of this sense of uncertainty or fear of failure. Or other people might tend to procrastinate, um, avoid doing the things that are important, maybe to not have the stress in the moment. Now, the important thing to ask uh, for this, these kinds of behaviors is the question, how helpful and workable are they actually in the short term and in the long term? And so this is very important to ask in, uh, if we want to really distinguish between behaviors that are, well, helpful and not helpful, because oftentimes the behaviors here that we do in more or less automatically in response to these thoughts and feelings, they of course can be quite helpful in the short term. They help us to relax, get rid of these or avoid uh, these thoughts and feelings. And so it can feel that it is quite helpful in the short term. And that's, that's actually why we are doing them. But in the long term, we should ask, does it really, do they really help us move in this direction in the long term? 
this is something very important to ask. And we might find that many of these behaviors that we put here might actually not be so workable and helpful in the long term. And so this kind of aspect is really something um, that is somewhat related to also mental health problems and the idea of psychological inflexibility, namely the fact that we could kind of get a little bit stuck in this side of the matrix. Um, we are noticing negative thoughts and emotions. We tend to automatically do something in response to them. With, we react with behaviors that are uh, have the function to get rid of these negative thoughts and emotions and sensations. But then sooner or later, they will appear again and we again react automatically because we have learned that in the short term they work. And so on it goes and we can really kind of get stuck here in this loop. And so in fact, um, mental health problems like depression or anxiety disorder, to some degree they have their origin in people kind of getting stuck in this loop. And so the matrix, with the help of the matrix, we can also become aware of this and then ask us in this quadrant here, what can we actually do to live in line with what matters actually, even if to these negative thoughts, feelings, sensations, even if they show up. So here the aspect of acceptance um, is also in here. So the idea that it's not about getting rid of these thoughts and feelings because they're just part of being human. They will always show up every now and then. And so how can we take them with us and still do with our bodies basically what, what is important? So if you think about this, you might think about things like maybe I will just take some, make an effort to manage my time better um, so that I won't get as stressed. Maybe I'll make an effort to learn about something new, even if I might feel a little bit uncertain about it. Uh, maybe I will ask others for help, even if my mind tells me you're a failure or so for doing this. Or I can just go for a walk, even if my mind tells me you don't have time for this or even if I feel a little guilt for taking some time for myself. So with this, in this way, we have basically done a whole walk around the matrix. We can always go back to any other quadrant to think about it again, what else might be showing up. And really the matrix is a tool that you can use anytime, almost anytime. If you're standing in, the, in line at the supermarket, lying in bed or and so on. And so it's really this noticing tool that helps us to just check on where we are in the moment in our motivations and experiences, how we react to our minds and our sensations. And overall to get us to have a life that is mostly more happening on this side, more about thriving rather than merely surviving. And again, it's not about getting rid of this side because obviously surviving is also very important. But I think we can all agree that um, we consider the good life being about thriving and not just merely about surviving. Here's an example of from the course, people, students filling out these different areas of the matrix using the tool Mentimeter. And this matrix is in, we can use as individuals, but also in a group context, a kind of collective matrix. And so when we see here answers showing up of different people filling this out, reflecting on these questions, this can help us to identify shared values and goals and also developing a sense of shared identity and building trust because we're noticing how other people in our group have maybe similar values and goals that motivate them. Also, when we're looking at how people in our groups fill out when they reflect these questions, this helps us to take perspective and also build a kind of trust and the sense of so-called common humanity. That's the sense we get when we're noticing that actually other people have similar doubts, thoughts, feelings as us, that we're not alone in the world about uh, how we feel sometimes about certain things. And finally, when we're also looking at the ideas that people have 
about how we might yeah orient our behaviors towards what's really important this can help us with collective goal setting and establishing a culture of learning and flexibility trying out new behaviors and new ways of how we might do things in our group so there's different ways for example um, online uh, digital tools we can use to for a group to fill out this matrix together and maybe also vote on priority areas such as goals and values but we can also of course do it simply with flip charts or on the floor um, with post-its and then everybody looking at their group matrix and maybe identifying uh, bigger themes. We can also use the matrix to reflect specifically on how we might implement any of the core design principles for cooperation. Because if you remember, there are many different ways to implement these principles. And so as a group, we have to find the flexibility, uh, the ability to learn and, and try out different ways how we might implement them and reflect on how it's going and how we might improve. So we can use the matrix for this process as well. For example, Here's a matrix that we can uh, use to explore our, how we might imp implement design principle three, which is about fair and inclusive decision making. So the group could ask itself, what's really important to us when we have to make decisions together or what kind of decision making culture do we want to have in our group? And here maybe things like empathy, perspective taking, inclusiveness might show up. And then importantly, we can also see what shows up in all of us that might hook us and take us away from the kind of decision-making culture that we want to have. So maybe individuals might have thoughts like, oh, I'm, my voice doesn't really count anyway, nobody will care, or maybe I will have a, a minority opinion that is not very popular, or others will kind of not react favorably to what I have to say. And then the way we react to these things might then be that we're just not speaking up in certain group discussions. And so this is, of course, then something that actually might take the group away from the kind of decision-making culture that they actually want to have. And the group in this way can become aware of this and then can together decide on how we can do things differently so that actually our decision-making is in line with the values that we identified and so we can flexibly find new ways to do things and uh, learn and, and reflect in regarding the implementation of design principle three. And the same goes for all the other design principles. So to summarize or to finish with a quote, maybe you, are, you have heard about this quote before. It's actually attributed to various authors the idea between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Or somewhat similarly, human freedom involves our capacity to pause between stimulus and response and in that pause to choose the one response towards which we wish to throw our weight. You can think a little bit about this quote and especially how do you think it might relate to the different processes of psychological flexibility that we have explored in this unit, including the relation to our values, to acceptance and diffusion, and our ability to mi for mindfulness. Mm -hmm.